Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and over the years, certain L'Chaim guests have become fan favorites. One of the most popular fan favorites of all is Dr. Jeffrey S. Gurak, the Libby M. Klapperman Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University. Jeff Gurak is a most highly respected scholar in the field of American Jewish history. He has twice been chair of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. And Jeff is an outstanding lecturer who speaks to Jewish and non-Jewish groups throughout America. And he is a superb writer who's authored or edited 18 books on American Jewish history, many of which have become classic studies in the development of the American Jewish community. Beginning with Jeff's first book, which he has since revised and updated, entitled When Harlem Was Jewish, the Rise, Decline, and Revival of a Jewish Community. Jeff's outstanding book on the life and contribution of Mordechai Kaplan, entitled A Modern Heretic and a Traditional Community, Mordechai M. Kaplan, Orthodoxy and American Judaism, and explores the ways Kaplan has had a profound influence on the development of all movements of Judaism and Jewish life here in America, including Orthodox Judaism. A book which won Jeff Gurak, the American Historical Society's esteemed Saul Viner Prize for the best book written in the field of American Jewish history. Among Jeff's many other works is a study of Orthodox Judaism in America and a look at Judaism's encounter with American sports. And I could go on and on and on, describe Jeff's prolific writing career. And now Jeff Gorak has written yet another wonderful and important profile of a slice of Americana that tells the marvelous story of a housing development of 12,000 apartments built in 1940 on just 29 acres of land in the eastern section of Bronx, New York, which housed some 40,000 carefully vetted working class residents who were lucky enough to wind up living in a two bedroom apartment for only $54 a month, a virtual self contained community of trees and flowers in a massive fountain area, a mere subway ride from downtown Manhattan in which Irish Catholics and Italian Catholics and Protestants lived in harmony, harmony alongside Orthodox Jews, Conservative Jews, Reformed Jews, Secular Jews. The book is aptly named for the place one refrigerator ad in 1940 called The Town of Tomorrow, Parkchester, a Bronx tale of race and ethnicity. And in this gem of a book that's an easy, fun read, Jeff Gorak tells the fascinating story of Parkchester's 80-year-old history, sharing with us marvelous, intimate stories of the community's multicultural residents, which chronicle Parkchester's social evolution on the one hand and its eternal character on the other. Jeff Gorak has written a beautiful historical and sociological study of a piece of New York that is a microcosm of America. Mazal Tov to you on another wonderful, wonderful, beautifully written, by the way. It is so beautifully written. You were just gifted. I've told you this before. You are gifted and you are able to tell a story, an historical story, in a way that is so accessible and fun to read. 
Mazal Tov. Well, thanks. I, I think we're done now. <laughs> but, but, but thank you very much. Uh, it was uh, a labor of love to a great extent. Uh, what you didn't mention. Yes, I is did that, on purpose. Okay. But go ahead and tell us. The last three pages of the book. Yes. You did. You tell us at the very. You and I look. We are very good friends. Right. I know who you are. I know where this book comes from. But you don't tell the reader until the concluding piece of the book. And what you tell us is? That I grew up in Parkchester, and I lived the first 25 years of my life in Parkchester. And as part of the research, I returned to Parkchester, and I met so many people who now live there. And one of the things that comes through, I hope, in the book is that although the neighborhood has changed a great deal, and there are almost no Jews living in Parkchester today, the people who live there remind me a lot of my parents and my parents' friends. They are African Americans, they're Latinos, they're Malaysians, they're Bangladeshis, it's Indians and the like. Many but who, are, who are Islamic? Islamic, yeah. right, for sure. There are six mosques in the neighborhood. Our synagogue, Young Israel Parkchester, is now a mosque, I've become very friendly with the Bangladeshis who run that particular mosque. And you become very good friends with a 19-year-old right. who ultimately, it's as if he becomes your guide to an area where you grew up with. And his name again is? Tamsadol Islam. Taz. Taz. Right. Right. Nice kid. I just want to say one thing and yeah. then tell me yeah. his story because I want to know if you think my description is accurate. As you describe it, it sounds like I was. What I said was the book describes an evolution of a community over an 80-year period. Right. It evolves in terms of the demographic that lives in the community. But the character of Parkchester stays remarkably the same. Is that fair to say? Yes, but it's, it's also a New York story, okay? You said correctly that it was a neighborhood, Irish, Italians, some white Protestants and Jews. But until 1968, it was totally segregated. No blacks, no Latinos were allowed in the neighborhood. And I study that. It's a book about race and ethnicity. And one of the things that I teach my students, and it's important to realize, is that we talk about the civil rights movement. We often talk about the 50s and 60s and all the problems that were south of the Mason-Dixon line. Well, our city was a very seg segregated city. And today, and in 68, Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation built Parkchester along with Stuyvesant Town. And 1968, the Human Rights Commission told them, if you don't integrate Parkchester, not only are we going to fine you, which we've been doing up until now, but we're going to throw you all in jail. Next thing you know, they open up Parkchester to African Americans and Latinos. And I want to say something else about the, the method of doing this book. Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation has an archive, and it's open to scholars. And they opened it to me, and I looked through the records. And you have in the 50s and you have the 60s memoranda which talk about how to deal with Mr. Brown, Mr. Black, who shows up and wants to come to Parkchester. And they get on the list and they never get off the list. And Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation never said that they were opposed to integration, but at the end of the day, you didn't get off the list. So, you know, one of the things in doing this book that I have to mention is it's a personal book. But I have to constantly check myself because um, I'm a primary source. I live there. I have what I call my truth. To what extent is my truth similar to other people's truths? So I thought about as a kid growing up, and you mentioned that I like sports and I played in the playgrounds. There were no black kids there. It never dawned upon me that they lived, listen to this, on the other side of the tracks. You use the expression, other side of the tracks, the other side of the subway tracks, right, that you take to Manhattan. Not only that, when you got on the subway, if you took the local express, and I'm interested in things like subways and air conditioning and things of that sort, you skipped over the South Bronx. You never saw these people, okay? So it's an interesting story about race and how things change. And again, I check this in a sense because I spoke to innumerable people about uh, what was your sense of race in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are racist, and there are people integrationists, and then there are people like my parents and ourselves who just live their lives happily in the neighborhood and never think about the question of race. Today, the neighborhood has changed a great deal, 
And again, as I mentioned before, you have all these different immigrant and ethnicities in the neighborhood, and they, they constitute Parkchester. And I want to say one other thing. I learned something about the term black. You can never refer to the people as black because African Americans, Afri Afro-Caribbeans, and Afro Africans who live in Parkchester, pigmentation-wise, they look the same, but they're very, very different. In their churches, interestingly enough, we often talk in Jewish culture about Ashkenazim and Sephardim now getting along in a synagogue or different people from different parts of Eastern Europe. Well, you have certain churches where the African Americans and the Afro Caribbeans don't agree on the nature of the liturgy. So, this is one of the things that I learned yes. and I want to teach during the book. I went back to Parkchurch innumerable times. I became very friendly with the people who now occupy the space which was my synagogue. And like anybody else who grew up in a church or a synagogue or a mosque, you remember your house of worship as being a very, very large place. It was a very small place, but that was our synagogue. Fifteen years ago, not thinking about doing this book, when the synagogue closed, I prevailed upon the last president of the congregation to let me loot the records of the synagogue. So with the help of the Dean of Libraries at Yeshiva, we rented a U-Haul van. I recruited three strong guys. I said, guys, we're going to Parkchester. We got to Parkchester and we looted the synagogue of all the records, all the records which are safely ensconced in the archives of Yeshiva. And I was able to use those records. Uh, I found, for example, I didn't use this in the book, a letter that Rabbi Schwartz wrote to the draft board to get my brother out of the draft. Uh, letters that we letters under the G file for Gurak, letters congratulating me on giving a talk at the youth Sabbath in the synagogue. It was, it was cute. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was that very nice? nice. Very nice. But more importantly, you see, I have no life, so I read synagogue bulletins. <laughs> and you look at the synagogue bulletins in the 70s, and first you see the rabbi saying, We need men for a minyan to maintain the service. And then a year later, we really need men. And then we're desperate for men. And now we have no service. And then the rabbi leaves because he says, Rabbi Schwartz says, an Orthodox synagogue without the daily synagogue prayers is not really a synagogue. So through that type of thing, you're able to see the story of that synagogue. But by the way, the book, I have to say, this is my first book which isn't about Jews. Exactly the Jew, right. Jews are part of the story. That is so correct. I'm on the Chaim, so I'm talking the Jewish piece, but it's, it's about... America. America it's and It's a piece of America. So, this kid. So I, I go back to, this, to the mosque to interview the imam. And he's a lovely gentleman, but he has heavily accented English. And I'm having trouble understanding. This young man comes over to me, he says, Sir, can I help? I said, sure. So he sort of translates for me. And then he says to me, would you like to see the other five mosques? I say, sure. We make an appointment to go back the following week. And we go from mosque to mosque, take my shoes off, my shoes on. Everybody's friendly. Everybody's interested. They know I'm Jewish. No problem at all. People are good people, okay? Remind me of our people. So while we're driving around, I say, you know, when I was a kid, I live literally around the corner from where you live. And on a snowy winter morning, the phone would ring at 6.30 in the morning, and Rabbi Schwartz would be on the phone, and my father would yell, Jeff, Noah, that's my brother, get up, we're going to the Minion. And we'd come downstairs, and we'd make the Minion. We need 10 men for an Orthodox service. Again, that's the problem which drove the rabbi out many years later. And after services, my father would go off to work on that subway, the old men would have a couple of belts of schnapps to get the, the motor running, and I would get a reward. The rabbi would give me a shovel to shovel off the sidewalk. So the kid says to me, that's awfully interesting, I use the same shovel. Now, I don't think it's the same shovel, right? But uh, it, it, it's it is the same. Literally the same, but it is the, the same, same shovel. shovel. And he has a... Um, he has a, a weekend job. He runs a youth group in the mosque. I ran a youth group in the mosque. And this kid now, he graduated Bronx High School of Science. He's now going to NYU on a uh, full ride. Uh, and he majoring in electrical engineering, minoring in business. And I end the book with this kid and I say, you know what? 
He is one of us. He could have been a member of the Young Israel of Parkchester. The only difference is he prays five times a day. Orthodox <laughs> Jews pray three times a day. So, you know, we talk, and listen, I'm not diminishing conflict between Muslims and Jews, for sure. I'm not Pollyannish about that. But on the human level, people, good people, try to get, a, try to get along with one another. And one last story, I'm monopolizing this, but I'm a storyteller. I take my, Pamela, my wife, and I take two of our grandchildren back to Parkchester to the beautiful Metropolitan Oval for a, ch for a children's concert uh, that same summer. And uh, the kids are on line and getting their faces painted like children like to do. And this Latino woman, 38 years old, who's getting her children face painted. By the way, I just want you to understand, it's one of the main things I wanted to talk to you about. Right. It is, in my mind, the single most important conversation, and it's only a sentence or two long right. in the whole book. Finish the story. Okay, so I'm talking to her, and I'm telling her about the book, and she's sort of intrigued, et cetera. So I said, how do you like living in Parkchester? She says, you know, it used to be great, but now we have all these Bangladeshis here, and they have so many children, and, they, and they, the, the food smell and things of that sort. It's just not the same. So I, I, I didn't confront her, but I thought to myself, gee, her grandmother couldn't get into this place, and she's fortunate enough to live in this place. So look at the contrast. You have this young man, and you have somebody else who says, the bang are the Bangladeshis taking over? It, it, it intersects with our contemporary conversations about who we are as Americans, as immigrants, tolerance and things of that sort. And my theme is that this is a get along neighborhood. I'm not saying that everybody who grew up in Parkchester were great friends, but we got along and that made Parkchester very special. And I also think I project, and maybe I'm wrong because I have no hard evidence, but I feel this, the kids of my generation who grew up in Parkchester and moved on because we became rich, et cetera, took out of that experience a certain degree of tolerance, which has held us in good stead for, in my case, almost 50 years. It's been 50 years. That's lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Lovely. Yeah. What, in addition to the fact that this is where you grew up, why did you want to write the book? And more important, Jeff, is this only interesting to people who live either in Parkchester, lived in Parkchester, or is this a book that will only interest New Yorkers as you read the book? Well, it's very much a New York story, but as I said before, it's also a story about the history of race and ethnicity, of the decline of ethnicity, of integration, of groups that, in terms of white folk, groups that did not get along previously. Look. The Irish-Jewish relationship in New York City and nationally was always a very difficult one. Frankly, the two groups never got along. And, but in Parkchester, they do. Prior to that time, prior to 1940. And what you say in the book is they're not getting along in communities all around Parkchester. Right. While in Parkchester, right. they are. Have, are you able to discern why? What was it about Parkchester that was different in the communities that were around Parkchester, right. where it didn't seem to work. Why did it work? Well, there's several in things. Several things. First of all, you know, I'm very critical of the racial attitudes of Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation. But when it came to white people, they were also social engineers. In other words, if you are fortunate enough to get into Parkchester, and there's a chapter called Fortunate, fortunate Apartment Dwellers, because thousands of people want to get into this new, newly constructed neighborhood, you couldn't choose where you lived. There are no Jewish buildings. There are no Catholic buildings, what you might have on the Grand Concourse, Eastern Parkway, etc. So when you move into Parkchester, you moved in with other people. That's number one. Number two, one of the canards, one of the points of conflict between Jews and the Irish was the sense that Jews were taking over the neighborhood, moving, well, we're all moving into the neighborhood together. That's number two. Number three, um, we often talk of 1930s correctly about the anti-Semitic priest, Father Coughlin, 
who operates out of uh, Michigan, but is heard all over the country. Well, it, it turns out there's also within the Catholic community an anti-Coglin group. And some of the people who moved the park just it came from Mott Haven in the Bronx, where there was a priest, and the name escapes me now, but it's in the book, who was an anti-Coglinite. Now, I'm not saying all his people were anti-Coglinites, but it tells you a lot about post-war changes in that regard. A third thing, and this I've mentioned before when I've written about the Holocaust, and I'm often misunderstood, but I want to say it as clearly as possible. The years 1939 to 1945 are among the most horrible years for the Jewish people internationally in our, in our multi-thousand year history. But it's also a good, it's, ironically, it's a good time for Jews in America. It's a good time for Jews in America. We sat together a couple of years ago with my dear friend Deborah Dash Moore, did a book called G.I. Jews, talks about G.I. Jews in World War II. Well, one of the things is World War II in Parkchester was a time of great patriotism, and Jews were allowed and encouraged to be part of the war effort, and that increased the sense of Jews being just like us. One, there are many other things. One other thing was that the occupational distribution of the men, and most of the men worked and the women stayed at home. My father was a firefighter. That was the number one occupation of Parkchester men. So they walked, I say, they, they marched arm in arm down Metropolitan Avenue to the subway. They got to know, got to know one another. My mother worked. She, uh, <laughs> she worked in the Empire State Building on the third floor. Well, someone has to work on the third floor. She was a bookkeeper, which, which was somewhat un unusual for the community. So people got to know one another. One other thing, when you study urban history, one of the limitations of Parkchester structurally was the absence of air conditioning. If people ask me, why did we move out of Parkchester? I said, air conditioning, there's no air conditioning. So I studied the history of air conditioning in New York City. And as a result of that, Parkchester, which was strongly built, it was a hothouse during the summer, and people, for ventilation purposes, opened the door. It's an open door policy. Windows and doors were open, and the O'Briens, the O'Briens and the Horowitzes and the Guglielmos got to know one another, and I'm not saying they became great friends. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying there was a certain sense of conviviality and you sat out in Metropolitan Oval, the still magnificent Oval, till 4 o'clock in the morning, and you got to know people. So all those things mitigated against the long-term antipathy that um, uh, was part of the Irish-Jewish experience. And as far as Jewish life in Parkchester was institutionally, there is a tradition within the St. Helena's Church history that the existence of the conservative synagogue, Temple Emmanuel of Parkchester, was due to the fact that when conservative Jews wanted to build a synagogue on what was called later Interfaith Row, there was a synagogue, there was a Baptist church, and there was this great church down the block. Uh, Father Scanlon, who became Monsignor Scanlon, very famous priest and Monsignor, he bought the land from a person who wouldn't sell to Jews and sold the, building, the land to Jews and that became, the, that became uh, Interfaith Row, okay? So there's a funny story in the book. Uh, uh, some of the Jewish kids ended up, who are good basketball players, I'm always looking for a sports angle, ended up, they ended up playing for the, the Shamrocks uh, on the uh, St. Helena's basketball team. So they got to one, go, again, getting to know one another doesn't mean great friendships. At the end of the day, people went their separate ways, and there was a, but there was an absence of the type of anti-Semitism that you saw elsewhere. And, and one other thing, there's a map in the book. You know, Mark, when you do this work, you sometimes think you're the only fella on the block doing work. And then you find out that there are people who are doing cognate work that's very interesting. There's a person who's done work on the history of gangs in New York City in the 40s and 50s. Everybody remembers West Side Story. It was based upon Leonard Bernstein looking at the, the gang situation in New York City. And he gave me a map of where the gangs were located. 
And if you look at the Bronx, you see gangs everywhere, but not in Parkchester. And that also had to do with the fact that they were Parkchester cops, who we eluded as best we could. And everybody has the same story. So I, one last thing. When I, everything I write about that I think it was my experience, I checked and double-checked to the best of my ability where the people had similar experiences. And when you have six people say, we opened the doors because of the heat, I'm permitted now to write that story. How much of this do you remember personally? So, for example, do you remember that your door was open because of how hot it was? Do I remember the heat in Parkchester? Sure. So we got married in 1974. I was about to go to Hebrews in College on a fellowship at the American Jewish Archives under uh, Jacob Rader Marcus. In and, Cincinnati. In Cincinnati. And my parents were there in Connecticut for the summer. So my wife, who grew up in an air-conditioned apartment, we moved in to Parkchester. And I said to Pamela, it's not so hot in here. So what are you talking about? We said, well, I'm dying. So if you ask me, do I remember the heat experience? Yeah, I remember my, wife, my marriage almost unraveled because <laughs> it was so hot in Parkchester. Oh. But everybody complained about the heat. And what people did, there was a movie theater, the Lowy's American. You'd go for a double feature because it was air cooled. Or maybe you went for a double, double feature <laughs> or you hung out in Macy's Parkchester. Macy's Parkchester was the first outlet store of Macy's because it was air conditioned. So here's what I think. My parents, my parents grew up in tenements. My father slept out in Central Park in Harlem when he was a kid. So Parkchester wasn't so bad. My generation said, are you kidding? If I get a chance to move someplace else. So I don't think it's so much white flight as we're doing better and we want and we're able to do better for ourselves and our children. This competition in 1968-69, Co-op City is built. They have air conditioning. So when I interviewed people, I say, how's the air conditioning story? And everybody tells me, oh my goodness, I took six showers. It was a terrible situation. But again, these nuts and bolts you know, about social history are very important, not as a Jewish story, but as a New York story, and the commonality of experience is something that uh, was, was very important to embrace as, as, as much as possible. And why I wrote the book was that I was thinking for a new topic, and I had saved those records, and that I had a wonderful student who did a senior thesis analyzing the rabbi's sermons. And I was on a plane coming back from Israel, and I said, you know what? Maybe there's a bigger story here. But again, it's not about Jews. It's about New York City, ethnicity, the crisis of race um, over, over the long haul. Well, it's wonderful what you did it the way you did it. And I'm, it's a real contribution. I want to come back. So you remember opening the doors. Did you have friends, for example, who were Irish? The kids we played with in the, in the park were Irish and Jewish and others. But to say they were my close friends. I didn't say close. No. Were, were you friendly? Always friendly. Men wore hats. You tip your hat to the woman. Back then, sure. There was uh, one of the kids in my building, uh, again, another sports story, uh, was a great player for St. Helena's basketball team. He played against Lou Alcindor, who became Kareem Jabbar. So we knew, we knew these kids. But most, most of my friends were Jewish. The Goraks were a little bit idiosyncratic because both my brother and I went to Ramaz. We, we were there on scholarships, you know, from the, this blue-collar neighborhood. I always say I was there on an athletic scholarship, which isn't really true. So I saw the kids of my neighborhood on Saturday and Sunday. So I had much less of a relationship mm -hmm. with, these, with other people. But I was, they, I was never attacked. I was never, did they ever make an issue of your being Jewish? No. No, no, no they, never. I'm a pretty good player. They said, where are you all week? <laughs> uh, no. But then it's, it's another thing. I talked to people. I had to choose this carefully. Did anyone uh, use the canard Christ killer here? So are there, fight, are there fights in the, in the playground? Absolutely. But my sense is, and there's a wonderful source in this book. There's an Irish-American historian named Peter Quinn who wrote a book about his experiences in Parkchester, and I met him, we become friendly. 
and he said something that really resonates with me. He said, the Jews and the Irish lived separately together. We didn't date their sisters, but we, there were, he, he said, there were no Irish pogromists, that's his words, standing on the outside of the court to beat up the Jewish kids. And I believe, I believe that to be true. So that was part of the experience. Okay. But you were very lucky, mm -hmm. it turns out, to grow up in New York City in Parkchester mm -hmm. because it was so atypical from what many other Jews your age, really a little older, had to deal with, yes? Yes, yes, okay. So people my age, baby boomers, talk about still having problems with the other ethnicities. Uh, on the other hand, if you, cho if, you cho if you consciously chose to live in Parkchester, you're, you're choosing as a Jew to live in a heterogeneous neighborhood. In other words, uh, in one of my books, I uh, interviewed Dolph Shays, the late Dolph Shays, who became a friend, he was a lovely, lovely person. And, uh, a great basketball player. And a great player. basketball player. And he said, growing up west of the Grand Concourse in the 30s and 40s, he believed the whole world was Jewish, even though demographically it wasn't the case. I'm living in a neighborhood where my parents, maybe consciously or unconsciously, chose to live in a heterogeneous, because Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation is telling you where, where you're going to live. If you move to suburbia, now there's a wonderful book called The Edge of Friendliness, which was a study of a suburban Chicago community during the same time period. And the author, Benjamin Ringer, points out that although people could live anywhere within this new suburban locale, Jews often chose to live among their own kind. In Parkchester, you didn't have that choice. You went where they sent you. People were happy to be sent there, but when you looked at the names on the address, the, on the address for the mailbox, you saw day one that you're not among your, your own kind. And the other thing is that there were no house, houses of worship within Parkchester. I think Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation didn't want what they would call the wrong element coming to church there. So there's that, that ring outside, churches and synagogues. So uh, as far as anti-Semitism is concerned, someone told me, I had to check it out, that there was a quota against Jews. I saw no evidence of that. However, I was told part of St. Helena's law, L-R-R-E, is that if Father Scanlon picked up the phone and called Metropolitan Life and said, you know, I need an apartment for the parents of a nun or a priest. The, the apartment appeared. That's special privileged treatment, not a quota system against Jews. And we never felt as if we were discriminated against in the neighborhood. And being from a traditional family, we were idiosyncratic in the sense we were concerned with maintaining our traditions. We were most of the kids in the neighborhood really didn't care, but that's not much in the book. I, no, it's I, not. No, I, I, and I was going to ask you, yeah. did, was there friction of any kind among Jews who prayed in different synagogues or who came from different movements? To what extent was in any way there a, uh, a hierarchy mm -hmm. of Jew based on what kind of Jew they were? Okay, so that's not in the book, but I have written a sidebar piece called The Jewishness of Parkchester, which will come out in a couple of weeks when this book appears, which talks about that issue. And I think among the young people, uh, whether they went to the conservative synagogue or the orthodox synagogue, again, we were different. We went to a day school. We went to Ramaz. Uh, there was a get-along spirit between the conservative and the orthodox. Sadly, and this is uh, uh, prescient as far as contemporary times, um, the Orthodox rabbi and the conservative rabbi did not get along nearly as well as the laity. Um, uh, the conservative synagogue was very anxious to welcome Catholic priests to speak from their pulpit. The Orthodox rabbi often invited Irish and Italian Catholic politicians to speak at the synagogue, but you had that point of uh, differentiation. And again, that it's early for the crises, in my opinion, that we deal with today, but you had some of that tension al along those lines. Did you experience it? No, no. Okay. Again, uh, go through life as a kid, oblivious to all these things, 
and then, and then you trip over certain things and you say, gee, uh, maybe I should have written about that, but I felt for this particular book. No, you're right. You, know, keep, you are right. Keep the Jewish stuff on the side. So I was fascinated in your discussion of the extent to which as ethically diverse uh, as Parchester was when you lived there and your parents' family, your whole family lived there, it was not open to anyone of color. Correct. Okay. And forget you, because as you just said, a kid just goes through life. Right. Do you have any sense of whether, A, your parents recognized it, and B, did it matter to them? To what extent... and. You're very sensitive to it now as an adult right. in retrospect. Do you think your parents would share your concern, or was it at a different time and a totally different mentality? How do you think your parents related to the reality that it was a, it was a non-black community? Okay, so in one of my prior books, I forget which one it was, I mentioned that I talked about my family in the parish, and I said my parents were very favorably disposed towards civil rights, we were very proud when, uh, when Rabbi Heschel marched with Dr. King. We were outraged by the uh, murder of three civil rights people. But I also said in that book, we were never tested. We lived in this neighborhood, and that's how things were. There's a story in the book. There's a particular family that appears many times in the book, and I've chronicled their lives over the entire long haul. There's a family called the Horowitz family. Yes. The Horowitz family. Irene and Julius. Uh, Irene and Julius Horowitz, and Julia Horowitz helped give me bar mitzvah lessons. He was a wonderful gentleman. So Irene Horowitz, who died a few years ago, moved in day one, and she stayed till she died over 100 years. Remarkable women. Now, and and in 19, when she was 99, she did an interview with New York One, and I had that tape. And everything she said, everything she said, checked out. Anyway, so there's a story that in the late 60s, when Parkchester was finally integrated, one of her sons, Michael Horowitz, who taught the first integrated law school class in Mississippi, comes to the Young Israel Parkchester and gives a speech. And he says, do um, uh, you think we can live together in a community that's one-third Jewish, one-third Catholic, one-third Protestant. His numbers about Protestants were off. And that was a very important moment in time. And people, and he said retrospectively, he didn't think the people in the synagogue were racist. They are just comfortable living their lives. And then I did similar, I found similar things about the Catholic community, where uh, uh, attempts were made by activist priests to, to encourage integration. And people were, they were not overtly opposed to it, but they weren't particularly favorably disposed. So I said before that there are people who are anti, there are people who are activists, like this Michael Horowitz, and these people who are just living their lives uh, in a very happy way and very concerned about what's happening in Mississippi, but it's not washing up on our shores. Uh, I, I need to say something else. I've blessed to have met some of the older African Americans who still live in Parkchester, who were the first people to move in when the doors opened. And who were they? Oh, they're just like everybody else. Some of them work part time, pro bono, and salary. They work for the NAACP, and they work for the Urban League. And when the doors opened, they said to themselves, Holy mackerel, we're going to do what everybody else does. We're going to jump to the front of the line. And they're there. And uh, one particular family, uh, Harold and Dorothy Jackman, I just saw them a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I spoke to, to, to Harold, and he says, well, why would you write about me? And I said, Harold, you remind me of my old man. Mm -hmm. He was a cop. My father was a fireman. They have two children. One is, has two social work degrees. The other one was a, in the American Air Force, he's now an airline pilot. And they were very much people who wanted to get into Parkchester, had been discriminated against, and were fortunate enough to get into Parkchester when the doors finally opened. And one other final thing, which I think is very important, we often talk about white flight out of neighborhoods. I talk about black flight. What I mean by that is, and this is New York history, when, when New York begins to deteriorate in the 70s, 
in the South Bronx, in Brooklyn, et cetera, where do the solid middle class, working class African Americans go? They flee those deteriorating neighborhoods, and many of them end up in Parkchester. Fascinating. So I want you to compare and contrast for me. And the thought comes to me, and you'll tell me whether it's fair. You spent so much time studying the Harlem community. And now you're studying Parkchester. And one of the things you seem to say about Harlem was there was a Jewish population. The Jewish population left. It was replaced by a black, the African-American community. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, well, it wasn't a Jewish community in Parkchester. Jews were part of a white, basically a white community, Italian, Irish, Jew. A few Germans, yeah. And they leave, and they don't leave because they're fleeing. They're leaving, as you point out, they want to improve them, their lives, and your metaphor is the air conditioning. But as they leave, they're replaced. Right. I want to know the extent to which there's a similarity, any similarity, in what you experienced and learned about Harlem as it applies to Parkchester, or are there, is it two totally different experiences? It's two different eras. When Jews leave Harlem, they're leaving a neighborhood that is physically in decline, and they're moving on to Grand Concourse, Eastern Parkway, et cetera. The Jews who leave Parkchester are not leaving a neighborhood that's been destroyed. You know, when we took the grandchildren to Parkchester, they wanted to see where I grew up, and I showed them the building. And of course, I had to explain to them we didn't own that building. We had a little apartment, two-bedroom apartment in that building. Okay, so it was a very, very different experience. Uh, people moved on, as opposed to the sense of being driven out because they're doing better. And again, it's not a Jewish story. It's a story, it's a story about mobility, and it's a story about different generations and how they experience New York life. And uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, the synagogue I belong to in Riverdale, Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, uh, has eight or nine couples who are alumni of Parkchester, and we're great fans of Rabbi Avi Weiss, who's been on your show. We're all good friends. And why did we join that synagogue in the 70s? Because it was like uh, a Landsmannschaft mm -hmm. situation. We wanted to pray with people we grew up with in, in that neighborhood. So the Harlem experience is very, very different. Uh, Parkchester, again, uh, oh, and there's one other piece to the story, and that is blacks and whites had one thing in common in the 70s. There's a chapter called Mrs. Helmsley Should Do Her Time in Parkchester. <laughs> which was a, the Helmsley Spear Corporation took over Parkchester, and they were integrationists, but they also sucked the guts out of Parkchester in terms of the uh, 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 maximizing their profits. So the blacks and the whites, the blacks and Latinos who move in, and the, the aging whites, they had a common enemy. The common enemy was the Helmsley. And fortunately today, over the last 10, 15 years, you know, that young man, he's got an advantage over me when I was a kid. He's got air conditioning in his apartment. Um, over the course of time, a new group came in um, and uh, re restored Parkchester, uh, urban renewal within the neighborhood. So it's a much nice, ironically, it's a much nicer place to live in terms of the, uh, the creature comforts. Mm -hmm. But again, it had the but what we have in common is more important, more significant than, I think, the differences that, that separate people. And uh, I have to say, Parkchester alumni, there, there are Parkchester alumni associations. There's one in Florida, and people want to talk about uh, the neighborhood. I made a very good friend of a Catholic priest. His picture is on the cover, Father uh, Thomas Duravan, who was there for 31 years. And uh, we become friends, and he wrote a very nice blurb. He said, uh, it bespeaks something very important that a Catholic pastor and a Jewish professor share a common experience mm -hmm. in the writing of this book. He's a blessed individual, and we become very, very good friends. I kept saying to myself as I read the book, and I, again, I'm, it, it may be projection on my part, the extent to which this is 
in some way a love story. And it's a very uplifting story. It's true there's an evolution. And the evolution, and the fact that this was a segregated community, there's nothing to be proud of there. Right. It wasn't, it seemed to me, it was not segregated consciously by the people who were living there. Right. Okay. Right. But the, within that community, there was something very lovely going on that I wish were more part of what America could be today. And I said to myself, why, there's something about this that is very, um, very, the good America was in some way a microcosm in Parkchester. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I want people who are living all over America to read this book, not because they know where Parkchester is, or some of the references you make will bring back memories for themselves, literally. Right. But because this is an American story that could have happened anywhere. It happened to happen, it happened to happen in this, how many acres again, whatever it is. It was uh, uh, 27 acres. 27 acres. And they built those buildings, by the way, they built those buildings like overnight, it's incredible. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And when they built them, by the way, they were new. Yes. Okay. And they were built in the shadow of what becomes this other development right. with air conditioning right. that, that also has an iconic presence in America. Right. Co-op city. Co-op city. Right. Okay. But it doesn't matter. When I read the book, it didn't matter to me whether I was a New Yorker or I was not a New Yorker. The story was about human beings who were in some way fashioned by living in America with other ethnicities. Right. And as you said now numerous times, that you didn't become best friends, but the doors were open. Right. Did you become aware that the story you were writing was not a story about where you grew up? It was a much larger story. Well, hopefully other communities have similar experiences. Uh, like I have to say, in more fairness, there's a chapter called A Mixed Reception, how the African Americans were, were, were received Okay. As the evolution of right. Park Chester developed. And it's a mixed reception. Three things. One, no active protest about their moving in. Some nastiness in some people slamming the doors of the elevators. People say, six people say the same thing. Other people, there was an article in the New York Times where African Americans said, I moved into Park Chester and an elderly gentleman tipped his hat to me. Yes. I was blown, I think she said, I was blown away. I yes. was blown away, you know? Yes. And so you have a mixed reception there. Uh, I also think in terms of interesting, in terms of the civil rights movement, you said correctly, the battle was not between the whites and blacks in Park Chester. It was the blacks against, and Latinos, against Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation. Yes. Yes. Okay? There were no protests in Park Chester. When they protested, they went down to Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation. In fact, there's a story early in the book in 1953 when an attempt is made to desegregate Park Chester where a group of Jewish communists and African Americans go down to Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation and they, they chain themselves to the desk. They get arrested because before 1954, everyone should hear this, before 1954, before Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, segregation is the law of the land and the segregationists, wherever they may be, have the law on their side. Say it again. I'll say it again. Before 1954, we are, a, we are totally segregated, not totally, but a largely segregated country. The Supreme Court basically ratifies segregation. C right. Plessy versus Ferguson, Correct. 1896. This is the law of America. The right. So when Metropolitan Life Insurance Corporation goes to the courts and says these people are interlopers, the courts up upheld them. Not only that, the general counsel of Metropolitan Life writes a law article a law article in the University of Chicago Journal, how they kept the fiduciary rights of the ownership of Park Chester uh, intact. And one of their issues is that we've kept the place segregated. Nobody is embarrassed. And they didn't burn the records. So I'm fortunate enough 40 years ago later to go to the archive. I'm flipping through the pages. Memorandum, say this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. And that's, and that's... Was that like a pearl for you? I, I, you know, let me tell you something. When you do this research, you sit in an archive, and you go stuff, and nothing, 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 and all of a sudden, 
you find something which is extraordinarily interesting and you know and it makes your day. You were kind enough to mention that on, a while back I did a book on Mordechai Kaplan. So he had 9,000 pages of his journal for 58 years. So you sit and you sit and you sit and nothing happens and all of a sudden Bingo. And you want, you want to say to somebody, look what I found. <laughs> yes. But you're alone in the library, and you just make notes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear the word schwarze as a kid? Yes. Yes. Not from my parents. But not from your parents? No. No. And there may be people who don't understand the reference. Right. If they don't, how wonderful. But at one point in the Jewish community, our grandparents referred to blacks as schwarze, which is the word black right. in Yiddish. Right, but derogatorily. Horribly derogatory. Right. And we had to grow out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, you know, in terms of your parents and your life in Parkchester, was it a word you heard? And the answer is no. No. But Michael Horowitz wants more from us. You see, Michael Horowitz gets up in the Friday night forum and says... We have to welcome these people into our neighborhood, one-third Jewish, one-third Catholic, one-third Protestant, and people shuffling their feet, and they're not yelling out schwarzes at him, but they're very comfortable with their lives, as are, are our friends across the street or down the block who are in the Lutheran church, which is all white, and today it's all African-American, Afro-Caribbean, and African, and they don't always get along with one another. Okay, so end this way for me. This is, some, this is where you grow up. You are a Jewish kid in a multi-religious multi community. Right. It maybe all white, but even within the white community, there are different ethnicities. Right. Okay. Now you go back. It's not the same at all. And yet there's something so similar. Try to put your finger on it one more time. When you go back and, and you experience, it's not it's home and it's not home at the same time. There's something about this that moves you, correct? Mm -hmm. And it is what? That I'm, that I'm welcomed back as an alumnus of Parkchester, and I can take my children, my grandchildren with my wife to a concert where I think we were the only white folks in the neighborhood, and people smile, and people are welcoming, and people have their own images of Parkchester. And I walk the streets, uh, you know. Uh, uh, it, it, it remains very much the same as far as my own sense of it. And everyone I talk to who live in Parkchester, we loved, we loved living there. Yes. I can't say enough about how, what, how fortunate we were that when the social workers came to my parents' apartment on New Bold Avenue and checked them out, actually a social worker went to check you out before you went. Oh, everyone was vetted. Uh, vetted. Six <laughs> ways from Sunday. Right, white gloves, white gloves, right? Mrs. Horowitz, they came with white gloves. And we were fortunate to get in. And, um, you know, my parents never said how lucky we were to be in Parkchester, but I'm implicitly, yeah. We were lucky. You knew they felt that way. We knew they felt that way. Yes. And when you meet Tez, mm -hmm. this young 19-year-old Bangladeshi, there's something you see in him that is you. Yes, yes. And that's also so moving, isn't it? It's lovely. And that's what your book is about. Your book is about your journey that brings you to a Bangladeshi black Islam kid right. who's you. He's in different generations. He's me. So I, I think uh, if there's a tagline to this book, this book celebrates, commemorates, but also does it in a critical manner. And sometime this spring, we're all, whoever we are, are going to come together for the 80th anniversary of Parkchester. So I hope to be there and to uh, talk about Parkchester. And uh, I, I've been offered numerous opportunities to already from people who want to hear about the Parkchester purchase experience and uh, to, sh to share their experiences with me. So it's a challenge and uh, a great opportunity. And thank you. What a fabulous, a fabulous work, of, a fabulous work again. Thank you. And I am so proud of you. Thank you. And you know, we loved each, we've loved each other for, for 
a long, long right. time. You've been on this journey with me since 1979 when we started this with Chaim. For sure. And I can't tell you how wonderful it is to have seen all the contributions you've made both to the American Jewish community and to the American community as a whole. Yasha Koach, Kol Tuba Thank you. I just have, uh, I just have to say that, you know, uh, a lot of the things that I've done and developed and learned even in doing interviews has to do with the fact of your mentorship uh, in addition to your friendship with Ruth and Pamela. So let's keep doing it. Let's That's keep just, doing it. Okay. Good for you. Dr. Jeffrey S. Gurak, the Libby M. Clapperman Professor of Jewish History at Yeshiva University and author of a marvelous story. You get the Jeff is the consummate storyteller, and that's also what makes the way he writes extraordinary, and I, I hope all of you can pick up Park Chester, A Bronx Tale of Race and Ethnicity. It is a wonderful read. It's available on Amazon and bookstores everywhere. I hope it becomes part of your home library. As always, I invite you to be in touch with me with any thoughts or comments you may have to any of the ideas expressed on this edition of L'Chaim. Please email me, and my email address is so easy to remember, rabbigolub at jbstv.org, or write me, or post on our Facebook page, or tweet me. I always look forward to hearing from many of you, especially if you ever lived in Parkchester. I want to hear from you, and I will pass your story, anything you write me, on to Jeff, and you already heard, if you want a piece of his, you want to see his piece that he's writing about the Jews of Barchester, email me, I will send them to him, and he will then get them to you. Also remember, you can now listen to L'Chaim wherever you go, and more and more people, I'm so thrilled, more and more people tell me they're listening to the L'Chaim podcast while driving in their car. Anyway, you can listen to L'Chaim on podcasts, just visit iTunes or Google Play, wherever you download your podcasts, and download and enjoy L'Chaim. And so until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'Chaim, my friends, to life. of Jewish education in media. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.